and I'm going to um, share with you how we can look into these things here. Okay, well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for every challenge and every opportunity to look at the things of our faith and of our lives. And tonight we pray that you would help us to try and see what the needs of our souls really are like. And then we pray that you would teach us how to learn lessons in prayer most meaningfully. And I pray that you will deepen our lives further. Teach us how to use the Word of God properly so that we can become even more conscious of how to apply your Word correctly. We pray for your blessings, your grace, your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the important things that I want to try, what do you do? I think that most of us, for example, <coughs> uh, we have this problem. I think we all have this problem. We all want to deepen our prayer life. But we don't know how to. The question is, how do we pray so that our prayers are not, after a while, so repetitive, it's got no meaning. And many people pray meaninglessly. That is always a problem. It doesn't matter. Most people pray intensely only when they're very sick. Then immediately after you get well, the intensity drops. Now, that would be a telltale sign that we don't really understand what prayer is and what it could be in our life. Then we say, well, I'm praying about something, but how come things don't change? I think that is a real problem. So I, I want to see, show you how to look at it. Uh, prayer cannot be learned just because you read a book about prayer. And I read about 45 books on prayer. Most of them are useless. I'm serious. They are flawed. They are just weak. They are frankly, not very useful. What's the best way to learn how to pray in prayer itself? Then I'll show you with you how we can do this. The second part of it is to share with you how you can use the scriptures. In this, in this case here, the book of Psalms. Um, and I, I've written on the whole book of Psalms, divided into several portions. Book five, five books of it all. So each one. So if you ask me to rewrite Psalms all over again, I'll probably write all over again differently. Simply because that's how rich God's Word really is. Over time, with the years of experience, the greater thought level ava available, you see it differently. So I'm going to share with you how to actually see connections. Especially amongst the Psalms of David. They are actually connected. <coughs> Very subtly, but they are connected. And I want to share with you how you can understand and appreciate these things here. But reading the Psalms is something that you have to do patiently. Many people read the Psalms as you would read a storybook. I, I read it. That's it. The Psalm is not a storybook. It's not a novel. It's not a historical passage. And you have to read it slightly differently. And every psalm has got a different feel to it. Now the question is, how do we do this? Right? So this is something that we're going to try to look at as we begin. Let's look at the uh, <coughs> book of Psalms. <coughs> we're going to take up Psalm, And I have purposely put there three to five. Now, we're not going to cover 3 to 5 immediately, of course. But tonight is 3, and then tomorrow 4, and then look at 5, Sunday school 6. But I will show you the connection tomorrow night of tonight's, because they are connected. So we begin here, and we need to look at how, how do we look at the Psalms. Okay, well, let's take a look at some of these things here. Okay, uh, so begin with Psalm 3. How do we study? These are called the Davidic Psalms, meaning we say one single author, David. 
And uh, usually when you read one person's authorship, it's easier to see the words he uses, the thought level he has, and so on and so forth. They're all connected. But if you read other people's writings, you've got to compare even more carefully. Because it's different. Same word, different meaning. Different application, different nuance. But with David, um, there is a great deal of similarity which I want to help you to understand. Okay? So we begin with, um, let's begin with, what is our prayer life really? If for some people, they pray three times a day, depending on how many times you eat. So you have breakfast, thank you. Lunch, thank you. Dinner, if you pray four times because you ate supper. That's it. And a lot of people don't find a whole lot of meaning in, um, you know, uh, in, in praying, actually. So how does God teach us how to pray? Seriously. Uh, you've got to bear this in mind. Okay? God does want to teach us how to pray. God does want to help us strengthen our faith. How? And here's the, uh, the simple answer is in the circumstances of your life. You know, we always pray for a trouble-free life. <clears throat> a trouble-free life is the most dangerous life to me because you don't understand anything. Because you're so trouble-free, you don't even know understand what's happening. Right? So I'm not saying to you, you should ask for a troubled life. That's the other extreme. But life will always have its challenges. The question is, how do you take these challenges and learn from them? Problems, setbacks, challenges, you name them. We have them. Okay? So this is important. How does God teach us how to pray? So please don't worry about, is there a book on prayer? I well, want to show, share with you how you learn. And that's how David learned. Okay? Now, let's take a look at Psalm 3 and uh, look at this very carefully. Right? This, uh, and you see, can you see right on top there, <clears throat> a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. <clears throat> now, this is called a superscription. What is a superscription, essentially? It's like um, a historical footnote you know, or head note. That's it. It is to tell you when this psalm was written, the occasion for this psalm, pay attention. If you were to understand prayers of David, you will find that when you study the circumstances of his life, then you understand why he said what he did. <clears throat> and believe me, he had problems in his life. So when we look at the superscription there, <clears throat> it will give you a historical uh, background. Check it out. And when you check it up, check up the historical background, then you understand, so that was why he prayed. That was how he prayed. Right? Well, let's take a look and uh, we'll see this. And the background that we are looking at is found in 2 uh, Samuel. Let's look at this very carefully. So you, you need to know a little bit about the history of uh, that is behind all these things. Okay, and this is important. So there we go. We really begin with chapter 13, 14, 15. <coughs> right? <coughs> and one of those big mistakes that many kings had in the early days, which they were warned about, but they did not pay attention, was don't multiply wives. Life is already hard. Every time you multiply a wife, you add more problems. 
because you're going to have children. Especially when you're a king. Everyone will be vying to replace you as the next king. So Deuteronomy 17, this is why the Lord warned. Don't do this. Didn't pay attention. But let's look at uh, Deuteronomy 17 first so that you can see this and know the wisdom behind it. <clears throat> okay, let's look at Deuteronomy 17. And uh, you see the wise piece of advice that Moses gave to the people when you become a king. <clears throat> okay, chapter 17, God says, I will set a king. Okay, verse 16, he shall not multiply horses for himself. Why? Because you tend to rely on the power of the horses. Nowadays, it's called horsepower. <laughs> Same. When people have a high, big horsepower in the car, it makes them drive crazily. When you have a small horsepower, even if you try, you can't. You just hope to make it before the red light <laughs> comes. You try to cross the green light. That's it. But big one, whoom, that's it. The greater the horsepower, the worse it gets. Now that, so don't multiply horses, actual horses. That's the first one. Okay, number uh, verse 16. Secondly, <clears throat> you shall, uh, verse 17, don't, don't multiply for himself. Why? Because the wife will turn the heart away. That is obvious, the obvious danger. The heart can be, for example, Solomon. Okay? And don't multiply silver and gold. <coughs> Why? Because you, once you feel rich, you feel, I, if you don't have money, you can't buy horses. You don't have money, you can't get another wife. You don't have money, you don't have all these things here. The moment you have them, see, they all tie in together. So you have one, you tend to have. But really, the last one was, the, the worst one was mentioned last, because the last one mentioned about silver and gold is what affects the others. See, a poor man can't afford all these things, can't afford houses, you can't, have, can't afford a big army, you can't afford uh, to have wives, you can't afford anything. And you know what? You're safer. So everybody wants all those big things. You have no idea what danger you're placing yourself in. I would rather not have than to have this and that and the other thing. For what? <clears throat> right? So this is important for us uh, to understand. So let's go back now to 2 Samuel and uh, we'll see this. Chapter <coughs> 2 Samuel. Let's look at... <coughs> Chapter 13 first. Okay? So, chapter 13. And we'll see this. Okay? So, first, here are children. One is called Amnon. <coughs> okay? Now, he has a beautiful half-sister called Tamar. Right? And so... He, is, he becomes crazy over her. Right? So chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> right? David, son of, uh, Amnon, son of David, loved her. And he managed to rape her, literally. And after the rape was done, he hated her. Because guilt was set in. So chapter 13 was there. So then we read, Right? Chapter 13, Absalom came in. And this was the sister of Absalom. He was very angry that his sister was so badly treated. And so uh, he went on there, and then what he did was to kill Amnon. Now, if you have one wife, you won't have that problem. You've got multiple wives. You're going to have multiple problems, obviously. 
because they're all half-brothers, half-sisters. And half-brothers, half-sisters don't necessarily have the same feelings towards each other. Different mothers will teach differently. And David is too busy to have time with the children. So one brother kills another half-brother. In the meantime, the half-sister is raped. What do you do? Now, Absalom is capable of murder. He will kill his own half-brother, all in the name of the honor of his sister, whom he loved, by all means. But that problem was created. And he's a prince. Can he get away with it? He did. He was not executed. He just fled. <clears throat> right? So here's Absalom in chapter 14. So he fled for a while. And uh, we read 13, 24. He fled. And then, of course, uh, he went over there uh, to, to another place there. And then uh, he was... Well, so David long to go to Absalom. <clears throat> right? So then Absalom comes back. And chapter 14, Absalom uh, was forgiven. He dwelt two years in Jerusalem, but he did not see the king's face. Then Absalom, this is all in terms of years. In chapter 15, after it happened, happened, Absalom provided for himself chariots, horses, 50 men to run before him. Every morning he would rise up early and then he would see to the people. So he would tell them, the king is too busy for you. Come to me, I'll help you. And so he began to win the hearts of the people along this line. Right? So this is what happened, chapter 15. And uh, he was there. He says, if I were made judge, so this is what it is. Now well, it came to pass, after 40 years, that Absalom said to the king, well, this is now 40 years, and Absalom, verse 12, sent for Ahithophel, the, the, the Gilonite. And the, the conspiracy grew strong. Who is Ahithophel? Grandfather of Bathsheba. And he's very angry that David killed his grandson-in-law, Uriah, and then took her to become another one of his wives. And Ahithophel never forgave David. See? So all the seeds of problems are there. The problems of life will be there. Like it or not, they're going to be there because we've already sown the seeds for trouble. Multiple wives, Right? Power, silver, gold, sons no longer under your control. Many years, they won't see them as long as you're a powerful king. But when you're 40 years later, you're not as sharp. You're not as alert. You're not as strong as you used to be. Now, that's where the problems started. Right? So Absalom, you know, I've been waiting for so many years. Who's going to be the next king? He hasn't announced who's going to be the next king. Right? So there's no successor in sight. Actually, the successor was Solomon. But he hasn't made an announcement either. Right? So everybody thought, I can be the next king. And Absalom began to make his moves. First, he wins the heart of the people. Two, he gets an army. Three, he needs a person wise enough, like Ahithophel. Ahithophel, as a counselor, was second to none. This man was a very, very experienced person. And he was respected. So his association with Absalom stood him in good stead. Now, this is where you read. So behind Psalm 3, all these things were going on. Okay? So then a messenger came. The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. How come? Neglect. You go to so many wives, you, you, you neglect one wife, you never come and see me. Yeah, I'm busy with you. You never come and see me, so busy with him. 
You never come and see me. This is how he has got no time. How many days are there in a week? If everybody asks you, you must spend time, you must spend time, you must spend time, his hope is gone. Obviously, not a foolish uh, thing to do. So the problems began to come. So Absalom came in, and this is what he did. <clears throat> okay? And so we shall, we shall not escape. <laughs> Let us haste to depart. Chapter 15. And suddenly, <coughs> lest he overtake us and then bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. <coughs> this was David in serious trouble. Who was the one attacking him? His own son. Now, if he's an enemy, he will raise up an army <coughs> and fight them. But this is his own son whom he loved. He loved Absalom for some reason. Really, this, his love for Absalom was very, very, very strong, very great. Now that became a problem too. So he was deeply conflicted. <coughs> Remember, this is not bit by bit. You see, the, the problem began slowly. It became worse and worse. This is why he said in Psalm 3, Lord, they, how they have increased who rise up against me. See? So Psalm th uh, 3, verse 1. Right? How many they are? They are, how, they are who really, they stood up against you, who have come against me. His own counsellor against him. His own army against him. His own son against him. And so in Psalm 3, you watch. You know, the best thing to learn how to pray is to look at the circumstances of your life and turn that into prayer. Psalm 3, verse 1. Lord, how they, are, how <coughs> they have increased who trouble me. How many they are who rise up against me. Psalm 3, verse 1. I, 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 this whole, I, I know I memorized the entire psalm. Because you should study it, look at it. It's so real. And then the despair. Right? Many of they say, there is no help for him in God. And he knew it. This was what they were saying. They knew, they said, God is not going to help him anymore. Those were his fears. Those were the despairing cries that he heard in the streets. And so they fled. So, we read, right? 2 Samuel 15, and they fled. And then, of course, that was a real problem. Okay? And so he prayed very, very much. So this is important. What happens now? Right? So he had to flee for a while. So chapter 15, chapter 16, before we come to chapter 18. So there was now a battle. And Absalom was a horrible son, a war-wasted one. And he dishonored his father completely. And so he was given an advice. Set up a tent. Go into the wife, to the wives of your father to shame him. And he did that. And later on, because he did that, David took all his wives and they were now sequestered. He would no longer, he would provide for them, take care of them, but they will no longer be his wives. And all because Deuteronomy 17 is ignored. You see, the problem is we ignore the word of God and the consequences are dire. One problem will come up after another. One sin will come up after another. And they won't stop. We can all pretend to be nice on the outside. But deep down on the inside, you're not the same person on the outside. So that is the problem. Behind Absalom was a sinister, dark character. This was not just son, not just prince. 
This man was a renegade. This person was a cruel, vindictive, brutal man who would stop at nothing to be king. He was so confident. He's got a counselor. He's got his army. He's got power. He's got fame. He's got the hearts of the people. What else would he need to succeed? He felt, I got everything except God. Will you succeed? No, you won't. So now it's a father and son battle. If only they had paid attention to Deuteronomy 17. They didn't. The consequences come years later. That is a big, major problem, obviously. Right? So we have to ask ourselves <coughs> what we are looking at. Okay, let's, let's look at it <coughs> very carefully. So this is your background. What are we looking at? <coughs> And it's only when we look at these things that we begin to understand what prayer is all about. So let's look at now at Psalm 3. <coughs> okay, so let's look at Psalm 3 and you will catch a little bit of a glimpse of what, how he prayed. <coughs> a lot of time, we just don't know how to assess the situation. The best thing to do is to pray to God. <coughs> Looking at the real hard circumstances of life. What was his circumstance? No point praying about something that is not even vitally connected. So don't pray irrelevant prayers. Make every prayer a relevant one. If we don't overcome this, nothing is going to happen. <clears throat> so what are the prayers which are relevant? Right now, the whole situation, okay, there are enemies. He didn't mention by name. <coughs> One, Lord, they have increased. He saw bit by bit. Almost all of Israel went against him. Increased. Two, <coughs> they have risen against me. What else? Look at it. <clears throat> they are now taunting him. There is no help. Right? So this is the physical side. <clears throat> right? This is where in war, the best thing to do is psychologically undermine them. Create fears. Create doubt. Create despair. Create helplessness, hopelessness, and you won half the battle. You see, every time we pray, remember, it's not the words we say. It's what's in your heart, what's in your mind, what is all around you. What's your answer? How do you pray like that? See, most of us pray about circumstances. Now, praying about circumstances won't change things. The circumstances will still be there. Whether you pray, you don't pray, the circumstances will remain the same. Absalom is now committed, has kind of committed treason. The crime for that is death. <clears throat> no question. One way or the other, his son will have to die. Question is, how? Now you have an option. What do you do? Raise an army to fight? You could. Alternative one. I can fight you. Now I'm sure there are people who are loyalists. And I'm sure there are some people who will say, you know, David, we're on your side. The older people rather would. The younger generation wouldn't. Was that an alternative? And the answer was no. What's the alternative? And he chose to pray. You know, a lot of times, we always, this, this psycholo psychology will tell you, is fight or flight. And we're always told, fight, don't flee. Fight, not flight. David chose differently. It's flight, not fight. Because his own son was involved. 
So he was caught in between. If I fight, there will be many lives lost. Obviously. What's the, what's the best answer? And Ahithophel was guiding David, I mean, Absalom. And his advice is good, solid, sound. How do you counter a person with that kind of wisdom, experience, and standing? Now, that is not an easy time to pray. So first, you bring it up. Okay? It's very important. A prize decision. Ask yourself, why am I making this prayer? Every time you pray, always ask, why am I praying like this? Do I understand what's happening around me? And every time we pray without really understanding why we are praying, the prayers you can pray and you forget. Always apprise yourself of the situation as it stands, as honestly and as candidly as you possibly can. It will help you pray. So look at all the options. Fight or flight. This is not an enemy like the Philistines. Even if it's another Goliath, he will fight him. But this is his son. He's stuck. What's the best alternative? But the best thing to do is recognize the place of prayer. Prayer is not just simply mumbling some words here and there, and then you just hope that God will hear. You're missing the point. That's not what prayer is. Right? So now, how do we actually make our prayers meaningful? Three things you must begin with. That's how David prayed. Okay? And he said, but you, Lord. <coughs> you see, this is where we begin. It is where it really, really is told. But you, Lord, are a shield for me. See? It begins with, do you really believe God? You see, a lot of people pray, I, I think I've got to pray, I must pray, and mumble some words. Really? Memorize it. But you, O oh Lord, if prayer is not a powerful, viable, important alternative, what's the point of praying? Because when we talk to God, we, when we turn to God, will it make a difference? <clears throat> Will it make a difference? Because if I come to God and I don't really believe He will make a difference, that prayer is virtually wasted, useless. So you've got to understand. So Psalm 3, verse 3, But you, O Lord, see, this is important. But you, O Lord. So ask yourself, when I'm praying these words now, right, what am I saying? What am I doing as I pray? Consciously, what am I doing? <clears throat> See, a lot of people like this consciousness when they pray. But you, oh Lord. <clears throat> but you, oh Lord, will you make a difference? <clears throat> if a difference is there, what is the difference? Three things that became the anchor of his life. And you will see this again and again as you study this very carefully. David will call it <coughs> his God, that you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. <coughs> now, David used the word shield in actually a number of ways, not just one. <coughs> right? Obvious level <coughs> A, shield of protection. What's the other use of shield? Later on, you read the other psalm. A shield of favor. Not the same. You will understand this at a later level. <coughs> a third level. <coughs> you are shield of salvation. Psalm 18. See, a lot of people think of shield as just protection. It's not. Protection is there. One aspect. Two. Favor, you will surround him. 
as with shield as with your favor. Three, you are shield of my salvation. Now you got to ask us, if I pray, do I believe that God is my shield? You see, David used powerful imageries to help him to actually pray. Say, you, O Lord, are a shield for me. Right? Then he went on further. My glory. What is the glory of being a shepherd? None. That God gave to him very much a glory of a king. God gave him a glory of being a warrior. God helped him to establish a powerful kingdom. That was my glory. Lord, you are my glory. You're the one who lifts up my head. His head was hanging low right now. It was hanging down right now. He was running. This represented hope for the future. Lord, you will lift up my head one of these days. See, this is how we... So part of it is remembering God in the past. This is remembering God in the present. The one who lifts up my head is the future. There is the beauty of this prayer. You see, we only pray for the moment. And so God does not become real or important to us. He should be. Right? I look at the present situation. This against all the enemies. Is it enough? Is God enough? Against the hundreds and thousands of people who would become enemies to David. Would it be enough? Against the Lord, and he had to flee. Remember, he's not a young man running from Saul. There, maybe in his 20s, you can run for miles and not be tired. That's 40 years later. Plus those 20 years, it is in his 60s, 70s. Those of us who are around that age, you begin to realize you can't run as a young man would. What's going to be enough? God has got to be enough. You see, so when you look at David praying, you begin to realize that he is presently, what should I be afraid of? Nothing, because you are my shield. Right? This is important. Now I think and I pray, I think of the little bit of the past. Where have I, where was I in the past? How did you bring me to the present moment? My glory. And the one who lifts up my head. That is praying meaningfully. See, we like that. We like that understanding. We like that, that depth. We like that comprehension. We like that connection with God. And so are prayers. How many of you remember prayers like that? Well, I remember all these verses. Right? Take a look at it. Because that's how I want to learn how to pray too. I want to look at the present, but I want to look beyond the present. You know what they always say? If you look at a glorious past and how God can help you, it will give you an idea what God can do in the future too. Has God not always been a shield for him? Has God not always been his glory? Has it God has not been the one who has lifted his head up again and again against the Philistines, against Saul, against all odds? God is not changed. Why can't he help me now? There is your hope for the future. See, that's what prayer should be. 
We pray about these things, and most of our prayers are fairly meaningless. We just go talk in circles. And we shouldn't. How should we live our lives? How should we pray? So this is where Psalm 3 becomes very, very uh, significant. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. <clears throat> so what's the best thing to do? After you assess the situation, verses 1 and 2, okay, you establish, Lord, you are uh, my shield, my glory, the one that lives on my head. What do you do now? Pray. Cry out to the Lord. See, most of our prayers are mumblings. And most of them are actually hidden grumblings. If we are not careful, cry out to the Lord. You know, you cannot cry out to the Lord. I'm crying out to the Lord. You're not crying. You're just mumbling under your breath. To cry out to the Lord in a time like that is a cry that literally... It's literally how when a person is desperate, what do you do? <clears throat> Please help me. I so you raise up your voice and you cry out because the death, the, the situation is desperate. I cried out, cried out to you with my voice. What do you do? How far is is heaven to, to us? Can your cry reach him? Right? One boy, was little boy was praying. <clears throat> and he was talking very quietly. Then he said, Dear God, please give me a bicycle for my birthday. And the mother said, There's no need to shout. God is not there. Yes, I know God is not there, but my grandmother is. He's not talking to God. He's asking for people to hear him so that he can have his bicycle. See, that's what it is, unfortunately. And we, we've missed the point. We really have missed the point. I cried out to the Lord. I cried to him with my voice. And you know what? He has heard me out of his holy hill. There comes a tremendous sense of assurance because you know God has heard your prayer. See, many times we pray. don't know whether God has heard, but I'll pray anyway. You pray like this. You can pray until the cows come home. Nothing's going to happen. <clears throat> that is a fact. That is a fact. How do we see this? I think this is important. How can God help us? Okay? Not only is he, okay, you, you can know this in your heart, in your mind, but you, oh Lord, this is all part of his prayer. Tell the Lord what you know about him. Tell the Lord you believe in him. Tell the Lord, but you, oh Lord, are a shield for me. Tell the Lord. What does that mean to you, David? Everything. But you, oh Lord, are my glory. You, O oh Lord, are the one who lifts up my head. That's what he I cried to the Lord. These were his words. He cried out to the Lord. Right? And he heard me. So one, two, three. This is what he cried. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say, there is no help for him from God, no help. Those were the things against him. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Right? So he tells the Lord. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. 1, 2, 3. I cried to the Lord with my voice, referring to one, two, three. You know what? And he heard me out of his holy hill. How far can your prayer reach? For many people, the prayers don't go beyond the ceiling. You wonder how far your, your prayers can reach? 
trying. My prayer will reach heaven. If my prayer cannot reach heaven, what's the point of praying? Do you really believe God hears? Now, this is a thing that David understood. God had heard those prayers. I cried alone with my voice, and he heard me. See, a lot of me, so you look at one, two, three, and four, and you begin to realize that this is how actually David prayed. Tell me, how do you pray? Compare. That's the way to learn. To compare the way you pray. Compare the way you continue to pray versus that of David. So I'm just giving you one, two, three, four. I cry to the Lord. <clears throat> How do you know? Right? So this is Psalm 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you begin to realize. So this is how David learned prayer. Now we don't know the earlier Psalms what happened there. But we know that he had to, he's so caught up with the family life, with his wife, with his children, with a, a affairs of the states and everything else. Where do you actually pray? And sometimes, in the harsh circumstances of life, are the times we actually pray. So are we learning? What are we learning about prayer? And many people not even learning anything about prayer. If I were you, I would learn. Because I want to learn as much as I possibly can about prayer. Because if i looking at my life, my life of prayer is pretty humdrum. No use. Right? What, I, what do I miss mean to you? We don't even know. I mean, seriously. What is God? You do have three things to say about God. To, say, to tell you what God means to you. What would you say? Can you say, Lord, you are my shield? Can you say, you are my glory? Three, can you say, you're the one who lifts up my head? See, most of us just pray. Yeah, dear, 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 dear. That's it. We don't have an idea of who God really is, for who He is and what He is to us. Right? Unfortunately. So when we talk, so we are almost talking into empty air. I'm just praying, Lord, what do you have in mind when you pray to God? David had the three things in mind. Right? And he cried out to God. My glory, my shield, my, the one who lifts up my head. So what's in your mind, in your heart as you pray? Now, a lot of people, we don't know. You see, most of us, okay, we pray to God our Father, that's it. David's life was very rich. And you know, the very words you utter in prayer matter, as you will see in Psalm 5 later on. What you say matters. Many people say, oh, don't worry, you know, it's what's in, only what's in your heart. Wrong. Your words matter to God. Because your word will reflect who you are, the state of your faith, the state of your heart, the state of your mind, for everything. And if they're not there, believe me, your prayer is flat. And so God doesn't seem to hear answer prayer. Why? There's something you need to think about. You begin to realize many people are not praying about things correct. They just want to get things done. Fix this problem, fix that problem. I got a problem. Please fix it. That's it. What do you think God is? Mr. Fix it. He's not. So you approach me. You want to come talk to me. Oh, tell me what I mean to you. What does God really mean to you? What do you really know about God? And for many people, as long as there isn't a whole lot of understanding, experience, and knowledge of God, those prayers are insipid, weak, placid. There's nothing there. Do you know how to look at this problem? How do you deal with a problem like that? That is the challenge of it all. Okay? So let's look at it further. Okay? 
<clears throat> is there a change when we pray, after we pray, right? So this is the situation. <laughs> this is a threat of the enemies. And it's a severe threat. Thousands of people. And this was prayer. Prayer becomes, Lord, you are my shield. This is my immediate. God, you are my shield. Where am I now? You are my God. Right now, I've got no glory to speak about, but you are my glory. I can't wear a crown when I'm running. There's dishonor, there's indignity, there's shame. There is no glory. But you, Lord, are my glory. And you know what? There's something else. You will lift up my head one day. There's hope, future. That's what you want to do. Right? So after we have made this prayer appropriately, is there a change? Now always look. What is the change? The change will be inside you, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, spiritually, you will change. I lay down and slept. I awoke. The Lord sustained me. You know why people cannot sleep? Anxiety. You know why people cannot? Stress. You know why people cannot sleep? No solution. So until we got all the problems fixed, you cannot sleep. Wrong. I lay down and I slept. I awoke. The Lord sustained me. The problems are still there. I'm now sustained. So people always ask me, how are you keeping? My verse, sustained. Now this is a real challenge. So on Sunday, I, I came late Sunday night. So Sunday was a very long day. My Sundays are usually long days. From morning, uh, 5 o'clock in the morning till <laughs> I came, I took the red eye flight. <coughs> 12 something. Right? So the next day, he reached here, 5 something. Pastor Chris was very kind. He fetched me at the, he met me at the airport. Then, um, uh, you know, the, the hotel was very kind. They took me in, and I was grateful. And not to sleep. Because Monday was another long day. So finally, I slept. Okay? Finally, I slept at 11 o'clock. That means over 30 hours. And you wake up, and you know what? You know God has sustained you. That's what it is. Right? I lay down and slept. I awoke. The Lord sustained me. There, you see the change. See? No longer, Lord, how many they have increased who rise up against me? Many are they who, I don't know. They trouble me. They, I'm not focusing on them anymore. That's the first change. Change will always take place, one after the other. Don't just stop at one. Some people can sleep through a storm anyway. But when you're, you are fearing for your life, believe me, sleep is not easy. It doesn't come easily. Obviously. Right? What's the next? I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have gathered around against me all around. There was what he was talking about. Can you see this? You see, the change was there. No longer one, I can sleep. When people cannot sleep and they need medicine to sleep, part of it, what's the deeper problem? Maybe it's a physical problem. Most of the time, it isn't. What's the problem? Emotionally, psychologically, in your mind, in your heart, you are so troubled. And it will lead into depression. Don't go that way. 
rest. Why? Because it's related. You are my shield. But oh Lord, but you, O oh Lord, are my shield, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord. He heard me. David sleeps. Physically, you need that rest. Rest. He woke. See, the very next day, his perspective of life changed. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have gathered against me all around. See, that was how confident he became. This is Psalm 3. Right? Now watch towards the end, how he concluded towards the end. He prayed, Arise, O Lord, against the enemies. Right? If this, the Lord will have to defeat them. Arise, O Lord. And then if you have broken the teeth and the arms of all the people, the enemies he had got, if you have. There is that confidence. You see, it's, the Lord, it doesn't matter with the Lord to, to whether the, the army is large or whether it is small. The battle belongs to the Lord. And this was all the warrior David was coming up again. See, he was no longer the David fearful. David was not fearful when he faced Goliath. He was not fearful when he led armies against the Philistines and he attacked them and killed 200 of them at one time. The fear came in. God has to change that fear and restore that faith, that courage, that strength, that positiveness all over again. That's what God has to do. And that's what he did. Right? And so he concluded, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. You see? So once you take a look at this particular psalm, you begin to realize just how real prayer became for David. It is not saying words. It was real to his old life. Circumstances, the enemies are still there. But now, Lord, you are my shield. You are my glory. You will lift up my head. If I really believe in that, that is, if I really believe in that, what can I do? I'm going to lie down and I'm going to be so tired, I'm going to rest. Which is exactly what he did. And he awoke and he found himself sustained. Right? And then he prayed, Lord, deal with the enemies. You've done this before. That's why he says, for you have. You've done this before. Do it again, please. Deal with the enemies. You know, hit them on the cheekbone and they would slap them because they're insulting. Their teeth is so hard, the teeth is broken. In other words, deal with them, Lord. Deal with them. And he concludes, salvation at the end of the day, it belongs to the Lord. Am I going to be saved? Am I going to be delivered? It's all up to the Lord. Not an army. Not devious plans. Not treason. Not all the people. It belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Is there still blessing? Yes. Your blessing is upon your people. Is there hope? Is there blessing to, to receive? Is there hope for the future? Yes. Two words. Salvation, blessing. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. There we go. You see, towards the end. At the end of the day, this is what your blessing, the benefits are upon your people. 
It goes back to God. Let's go back to basics. You see, many of us just say prayers. What is in our mind when we say prayer? Nothing. Do I have faith and hope? No, I don't. I just say prayer. Of course prayer is meaningless. Because that is not a way to pray. You see, if I'm grappling with just words, how can I say, and I say prayer is not very meaningful? Of course. Because you're not very meaningful either. Right? You, you see the challenge of it all? So if I really want to learn how to pray, I have to go back to all over again. How am I presently praying? Right? Oh, we all, the first two verses we can identify easily. Right? Because there are problems, there are difficulties, there are enemies, there are, diff- there are challenges which you can't solve. Right? But what's your answer to the problem? Verse 3, David's answer is with the Lord. But you, see, that's your difference. But you, O Lord, you are my shield. You are the shield for me. My glory, the one who lifts up my head. So that's how I, that's how I, so when I pray to the Lord, Lord, help me. I don't just simply just say, Lord, help me. That's important. Right? So the challenge is, how do we do this properly, effectively in prayer? Makes all the difference in the world. Right? Then you see all these things. The, the challenges are very real. So that we have to, first and foremost, check the way we pray. What do we think about when we pray? Do we really believe that God will hear our prayers? You know, I'm here, you know, I'm one of seven billion people on this earth. Will God really hear my prayer? Yes. Really? What am I praying about? What's the change? If it's real, if prayer is real at all, you will start to change. And all of us pray need to be changed. We all need to pray about changes. Right? So we've got to change our approach. We've got to change our understanding. We've got to change the level of our faith. We've got to change a lot of these things. Can God really, really help me? The answer, yes, absolutely. Is there a future? The Lord will, do I, do I really? God will lift up my head? Yes. God will be your glory? Yes. Why not? See, but when once we're struggling with, I don't really believe, I can't really believe, that's what we're saying, we're stuck. Because nothing's going to happen. Because I don't really believe that God can do it or will do it. Then what's the point of praying? That a lot of people see no reason to pray. You see, you need that connection with God. You've got to ask that, could you help me? Right? Though I tell Pastor Chris, you know, I'm coming very early in the morning, unusual, because the next day's flight is just as full. I couldn't get in. Okay. On the plane here, the plane was full too. It was really, really full. But can you? Fine, let me do it. So I'm just glad he's there. That's what it means for us. See, that's what God will do. If a, a thousand times better, a thousand times more significantly, God wants to be our glory, our shield, the one. But you got to say, do I really, really believe God will do that? And if I don't, why pray? Why bother? Right? Right now. What do I do? Raise an army? Can't. David was really out of touch with his people. That's what happened. He was out of touch with his army. He was out of touch with his people. But there were other people whom God sent. One of those men called Hushai. And he was there to subvert the words of Ahithophel. And he knew it. He did it successfully. All the counsel of Ahithophel went off. And he knew it was over. His 
career as a counselor was over. He went there. What happened to the enemy? What happened to Ahithophel? The one who was behind Absalom. He went to hang himself. That's how God deals with problems. You don't even have to do anything. They will do harm to themselves. See, that's how God solves problems. Is don't, please never pretend to or pray, I'm a very prayerful prayer. Don't kid yourself. God knows exactly the score. He knows the state of your faith, whether you are true or you're false. He knows. So what's the point of trying to bluff him? You can bluff people, but not God. What's the point? I would rather pray honestly. Lord, I need help. What do you do? What do you want to do? What do you want me to do? See, a lot of times we don't even realize it. It's going to be that? Yeah. So we begin with Psalm 3. Now, we're going to see the connection with Psalm 4 because they are connected. The question is how to see the connection. So let me encourage you. Instead of prayer is not something you want to talk it to death. That's something I don't want to do. I just want to open up this psalm so that you see in your mind there are problems. You see, the David's problems are actual enemies. Ours is not enemies, just simply problems. See, whether they are enemies that create the problem or lions create problems, they are problems. It doesn't matter in what form they take, they are there. And this lingering doubt will be there. There no help for him with God. From God, nothing. God's not going to help him. It's beyond help. See, the doubt will come. The unbelief will come. And it will hit you hard. Now, you want, you want to believe. You want to believe those doubts? Or you want to go back to, I want to go back to God. Then a more we tell you, ah, it's not going to work. Yeah, you just, yeah, you become what we call a prophet. It's called a self-fulfilling prophet. You prophesy that no, God will not hear you, and you just fulfill your own prophecy. So you are a self-fulfilling prophet. Quite useless. Yeah, I don't want, I want to see the Lord make a difference in my life. Change me, help me. So every year I face the same challenge, you know. I'm one year older this last year than last year. And every time I'm one year older and I go to ask myself, what do I do next? What do I want to do now? This year. What will it be like this year? I'm not going to rely on last year's grace and mercy and strength. I'm going to start afresh. But you, O oh Lord, are my shield. You are a shield for me. My glory, the one who lifts up my head. This is what I'm going to say to the Lord. And I cried out to the Lord, and He heard me from this holy hill. He will take time. Later on, He will explain. He will take time to pray. Right? He upholds those who fall. This Sunday, upholds those who fall. There He fell. The Lord upholds those who fall. That's what He does. And it's beautiful when you read it. Now, when you've got no words to say, the best thing to do, take the words of the Lord, hide them in your heart until it's so much a part of you, they just come out. That's how I pray. I, could, I don't know what to say half the time. So what do I do? I just memorize the Lord's word until the words form in me. So when I pray over a problem, straight away, Psalm 3, verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. When I can't do anything else, I lay down, I slept. I awoke. The Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have gathered themselves around me, against me. You know what? Not afraid. Why? See, because he is God. What happened? God took it away. The unbelief, God took it away. Can, can Solomon uh, later on become the next king, as God said? Will he go back to become king again? Will he? See, we've got to figure it out. What will happen? What will happen? 
that that is where prayer is. Praying is an exciting thing to do. Why? Because you wait to see how God will answer. There may be health challenges, and there are many. As we grow older, every year more health challenges will come. Believe it, it will, they will come. And what do we do? We cry out to the Lord. And we say, Lord, help me. Do you really believe that? That you, O oh Lord, are the shield for me. My glory is the one who lifts up my head. Right? You want to see the change? Suddenly, am I afraid of uh, being one year older? No. Why? I would not be afraid with your answer. Of ten thousands of people who gather against me all around. Why? Because salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. So, before you know it, some three, one to eight, memorize already. It becomes your prayer. Why? Why is very hard? Of course, it's hard. Who says it's easy? Prayer is not easy. But you really want to pray. You really want to learn how to pray. You do everything you can to pray. To why did, if I can't, well, the Lord's word will help me, and it will. That's how it works. And thank God. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for hearing our prayers. Thank God for His promise of salvation, for His promise of blessing. <coughs> That's how I look at, you know, 2019. Happy New Year. Seriously. Why can't we have a happy new year with all these things there? Of course, why not? Well, may the Lord help us. Think about these things here. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you <coughs> for your word that teaches, that gives us insight, that corrects, that rebukes. And Father, we pray that we will take heed that we will begin to pray about the changes that ought to take place beginning tonight, beginning right now. And Father, help us to turn to you, to think of you as our shield, our glory, as the one who will lift up our head too. Help us to know that you are able to give us salvation and blessings for this new year that we have. Help us to step forward confidently with this kind of assurance that you will indeed bless your people. Help us to be among your people, truly, honestly, earnestly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay, thank you for being here. Tomorrow we will look at Psalm 4. <coughs>